This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. For 30 years, the Man of Steel, Joseph Stalin, ruthlessly dominated the Soviet Union. He had created a larger empire than any of the Tsars. He was probably the most successful ruler that Russia ever had. But he gets the prize as the most evil thing the human race has ever produced. Rising from within a band of revolutionary zealots, this is the story of a man whose pursuit of absolute power transforms a nation. Stalin found Russia with the wooden plow and he left it with atomic weapons. But the blood-crazed Soviet strongman's tools for progress are famine, slavery, and execution. People didn't count to him. They were no more than rats. And yet to this day, some of his countrymen lionize him as the man who made Russia a superpower. For 300 years, the autocratic Romanov dynasty have ruled the Russian Empire with an iron fist. But a crushing defeat in the First World War and economic problems at home mean that the current ruler, Tsar Nicholas II, is losing his grip on power. The country is ripe for revolution when in October 1917, the Communist Bolshevik Party storms the Winter Palace and takes over the country. Under revolutionary leader Vladimir Lenin, a new Marxist government fights a civil war to maintain control. The civil war was a time when the Bolshevik Revolution was struggling to survive. It was surrounded and beleaguered on every side by enemies. The only way it was going to survive was by extremism, by terror, by ruthlessness. Among the men vying for a top position in Lenin's regime is future Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. People wanted to be president. They wanted to be a people's commissar for this, for defense, for foreign affairs. They wanted the glorious jobs. What they didn't realize was Stalin was going to eliminate all of them. Born Joseph Jugashvili, the man who will become Stalin, isn't even a Russian. He's a Georgian, born into poverty in 1878 on the wild frontiers of the Russian Empire. He was I believe five foot four. He was short. And he didn't like to be short, but he was short. And he had a Napoleonic complex from day one. He always wanted to be number one, and he never conceded he was wrong. He was always right. He had this self-belief, this huge self-belief. Young Joseph gets the best education available at a Russian Orthodox seminary. His mother, wants him to become a priest. But he has other ideas. While he was at the seminary, Stalin first of all became an atheist. Then he started to study the works of Marx. German social philosopher and author of the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx is all the rage in radical European circles. His writings opened Stalin's mind to the possibility of revolution against the Tsarist regime. He was a bright young man who needed a cause. Not that different from those guys who are joining up to uh, ISIS today. His cause became that of communism. When he is 20 years old, Stalin leaves the seminary 
to become a political activist in the illegal Georgian Marxist movement. But trying to topple the Tsar is a deadly game. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From uncovering ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. And it's not just documentaries either. We have a network of incredible history podcasts bringing you new episodes every day. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. His secret police, the Okrana, are on the lookout for subversives. The life of an underground conspiratorial Marxist um, was a very strange one. Um, you changed your name constantly, you moved house constantly, you had very quick love affairs with people and then never saw them again. Um, you could trust nobody. Full of idealism, Stalin adopts the codename Koba after a Georgian Robin Hood and begins to organize industrial workers to destabilize the Tsarist regime. He went to Batumi, which was an oil terminus, on the Black Sea. And there were thousands of workers worked there. And Stalin immediately arranged uh, a series of strikes. It is here in Batumi that he gets his first real taste for blood. In 1902, his strikers confront the authorities and the police open fire on them killing 15 and injuring many more. Stalin gets away unscathed, but he does tend to the wounded. The death toll does not worry him one bit. In fact, it teaches him a lesson he will never forget. The strike is like an epiphany for him, that he saw in the act of violence the way forward. That is how you change Russia. And that's how you progress the revolutionary movement. Physical violence is of the essence. Stalin's activities get him noticed. He is invited to meet the great leader of the movement, Vladimir Lenin the man he considers to be the mountain eagle of the revolution. Lenin was really Stalin's teacher in the practice of terror. Lenin sees in Stalin a man of loyalty, a man committed to the cause, as Lenin defines it, and a man who's prepared to do the dirty work. Lenin gives Stalin a key mission, to raise money for the revolution. He goes to the booming port town of Baku, full of newly rich oil barons and comfortably far from the center of Tsarist power. Here, he becomes a mobster and sets about fleecing the capitalists. Stalin ran a gang there that was called something like The Outfit. They were a pretty motley bunch. And he ran brothels, more than one. He's shaking people down, he's pushing people around. And that meant bank robberies, piracy, and protection rackets. To Stalin, the law does not matter. Lives do not matter. You do what is necessary. <laughs> this is the key Leninist principle. What is necessary at the moment, you do regardless of consequences. The only thing that matters is the revolution. By now, Stalin is high up on the Tsarist secret police's most wanted list. 
but he is not yet the murderous psychopath he will become. He falls in love with Ekaterina Svanitsa, the sister of a fellow communist, and in secret, they marry. She was what the Georgians called a baba. She, she was the woman who was at home and just provided the creature comforts. Katerina bears Stalin a son, Yakov. But just months later, she contracts typhus and dies. When Stalin's first wife died, he was absolutely shattered. He said that when she died, all my feelings for people died with her. She melted my stony heart. Now the shutters start to come down. Stalin decides that no one will be allowed into his heart again. It's a trait which will serve him well on his rise to power. By 1906, Tsar Nicholas II's regime is on the rocks after a wave of strikes, economic chaos, and an attempted revolution. In a small concession to democracy, he sets up a parliament called the Duma. Lenin's so-called Bolshevik party wins seats there, though he continues his illegal struggle against the system. Stalin is still a wanted man, spending years in prison and exile. But his friend, Roman Malinovsky, becomes the leader of the Bolsheviks in the Duma. In 1912, Stalin escapes from exile and heads for the capital, looking for a safe base of operations. He immediately came to see his friend Malinovsky. Stalin likes Malinovsky and trusts him. A big mistake. Malinovsky was, in fact, a czar's secret agent. Malinovsky is the most highly paid double agent the Tsar's Okhrana secret police has ever had. He invites Stalin to a fundraising dinner. And Stalin agrees to go. Well, Malinovsky must have been a very, very good actor. Because the Okhrana would have set up the meeting and they would have told him what to say and how to proceed so that there would be no suspicions aroused in Stalin's mind. The dinner is a trap. He's betrayed by a party member, he's betrayed by a fellow Bolshevik. He's sentenced to exile. He takes with him this burning conviction that he'd given trust to someone who could not be trusted. The betrayal has a colossal impact on Stalin. He starts to believe that even those who are closest to him, even the most loyal and committed communists, may be traitors. The interesting thing about the Malinovsky story is it explains why later in Stalin's life um, he distrusted everybody, because virtually anybody, even the leader of the Bolshevik party in the, in the Duma, could be a secret agent and a traitor. Consumed with bitterness, Stalin is sent into exile in Siberia, on the edges of the Arctic Circle. He is largely ignored by his communist colleagues, who this time do not bother to help him escape. In Stalin's mind, there must have been a lot of anger about the way he'd been treated, the way his comrades had betrayed him. They didn't give him his due, so they belittled him, if you like, and they put him down. So therefore, all this will be stewing in uh, Stalin's mind. How can I take revenge on these people? I'm a much more important person than they think, and I'm going to show them that. For four years, Stalin is stuck in the frozen wasteland, his heart becoming as cold and hard as the wilderness around him. Food was in very short supply, and it said that every night the wolves gathered round looking for the bits of food that might be left. The prowling wolves will haunt Stalin to the end of his days. 
a common theme in his doodles was, was ravening wolves. And he put them around the, the page. The teeth bared showing. Churchill later said there was something wolf-like about him. And it may be that he wasn't, that wasn't just a, a, a happy metaphor. He, there was actually this Wolverine element coming out in him. So when the Bolsheviks seize power in 1917, Stalin returns to the capital, ready to take his place in Lenin's new communist government, bringing with him a brutal mindset born of years of struggle. Violence is not merely a means to an end, it is the end in itself. You only win by smashing the enemy. The budding tyrant abandons his birth name forever and becomes officially Joseph Stalin, meaning man of steel. He's one of Lenin's most trusted leaders and a member of the Communist Party's Central Committee. But he is neither the most senior nor the most popular. When Lenin hands out the top jobs, Stalin's rivals in the top tier of the party seem to get the best positions. He didn't have that particular grain of academic intellectualism that Lenin and Trotsky had. And I think it made him feel inferior. The charismatic Leon Trotsky, who snobbishly fails to recognize Stalin at a party meeting, gets foreign affairs and the Red Army. Trotsky made the great mistake of snubbing Stalin. Trotsky didn't realize this. He was singled out to be set aside and destroyed. School teacher turned revolutionary, Lev Kamenev, gets to run Moscow and is made Lenin's deputy. The conventional Marxist intellectuals looked at Stalin and they dismissed him. They just had no idea of how much uh, uh, Stalin could do. Because he admires his organizational skills, the job Lenin gives Stalin is an administrative role, the general secretary of the Communist Party. Nobody else wanted the job of General Secretary. The General Secretary's job seems quite a boring one. While Trotsky and Kamenev strut the political stage, it seems Stalin is assigned menial paperwork. He is left working in the background while they take all the glory. But it's not long before he realizes that in reality, the General Secretary holds the key to power. A secretary decides who is going to come to the meeting, who's going to be told about it, what's going to be on the agenda. The new Soviet Union is run by committee. If you control the agenda, you can control everything. Gradually, he controlled appointments. And by controlling appointments, he could put his people into various committees. And if you could get a majority in the center committee, you were the number one man. While Lenin and his top team are distracted by all the problems of running a country that has been downtrodden for years and just come through a civil war, Stalin builds his power base and bides his time. All the while, he plots his revenge against the snobbish intellectuals who dismissed him. If you made a point of, of humiliating Comrade Stalin, your days were numbered. There is no question about that. In 1924, Lenin, the unquestioned leader of the revolution, dies of a cerebral hemorrhage. Stalin is among the party leaders carrying Lenin's casket to its final resting place. But one important person is not there. Leon Trotsky, the general secretary, hasn't invited him. Stalin sends the wrong date deliberately to prevent Trotsky turning up at the funeral. And because he didn't turn up, what sort of Leninist could he be, this man who doesn't turn up? With Trotsky absent, 
it falls to Stalin to deliver the eulogy. To thee, great Lenin, we owe all that we have. To thee, great Lenin, uh, we dedicate ourselves. To thee, always to thee, great Lenin. A way of saying, I am your heir. Stalin's plan works. Though officially just the general secretary, enough of his supporters are in place to help establish him as the heir to Lenin. Now, he can turn on his rivals. First up, Leon Trotsky. Getting rid of Trotsky was, was, was a refined, delayed process. It was drawn out for his own pleasure. It was suggested to Trotsky that um, he had no place in the capital. He was dragged kicking and screaming to the train. Trotsky is forced to flee overseas and ends up in Mexico. Eventually, Stalin sends an assassin to pick him off. By the time of his 50th birthday celebrations, five years after the death of Lenin, Stalin is firmly in charge. Though he has kept the humble title General Secretary, he is effectively the top man in the Soviet Union. But despite a decade of communist rule, the country remains desperately backward. Stalin decides that what it needs is a dose of his ruthless Marxist medicine. The first area to fix is farming. Stalin was convinced that the Russian peasant was unproductive and could be replaced with tractors. And that led to the first the really murderous uh, acts of Stalin. In December 1929, he unleashes the poorest peasants against the land-owning farmers called kulaks. All such class enemies are to be exterminated. The order that Stalin gave for the liquidation of the kulaks as a class is the first legal order of a state for the mass murder of its own citizens. They were no more than rats. Uh, they had to be wiped out. They were vermin. Then, in the name of liberating them, Stalin forces the peasants to work on vast collective farms. To speed Russia's rapid industrialization, he confiscates the grain, using it to feed factory workers in the cities and to sell abroad. Propaganda films portray the collective farms as a triumph. But the truth is exactly the opposite. Production collapses and famine breaks out across the Soviet Union. Stalin must have foreseen there would be a famine. He probably didn't foresee that it would kill probably 10 million people. <laughs> By 1933, you had cannibalism all over southern Russia. It was the most appalling man-made famine in history, uh, and it was done deliberately. Stalin does not care about the deaths in the countryside. It's a price worth paying for his revolution. Stalin once said, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. A Bolshevik like Stalin, and Stalin prided himself on this, um, could look at things harshly with toughness. And as he said to Lenin, my hand will not tremble. In the cities, news of the famines is suppressed. But it starts to leak out. One night in the Kremlin, Stalin is enjoying a dinner party with his second wife, 
Nadia. He didn't want everybody, particularly his family, to know what was going on. They would have regarded this annihilation of the peasant classes as a betrayal of their ideals. But Nadia has heard the rumors about the extent of the famine. They sort of gazed at each other across the table and she got up and flounced out. Hey, don't write it! She was very, very upset. Later, in her room, she writes a note condemning the Stalin. She didn't believe that anything that Stalin was doing in his policies were the right policies. She couldn't go along with the collectivization and the annihilation of the peasant classes. This was certainly such a challenge thrown down Stalin that he was wrong. Later that night, Nadia takes the only way out. To Stalin, her suicide is not a tragedy, it's a betrayal. Nobody was allowed to say that anything he said or did was wrong. And she had made this ultimate gesture with her life to say what you're doing is wrong. So it, it made him completely furious. He was heard to say, she went away as an enemy. Nadia's death is reported as due to appendicitis. With her female influence gone, Stalin becomes more isolated and more paranoid. The days of the Great Terror are about to begin. In January 1934, Joseph Stalin summons the supreme decision-making body of the Soviet Union, the Party Congress. It's the largest meeting of Soviet leaders in four years. One of those summoned is his loyal supporter, Sergei Kirov. Kirov thinks he is the closest thing Stalin has to a friend. The general secretary himself gives Kirov the choice position of Leningrad party boss. But the paranoid leader believes Kirov has become too popular among the party delegates. Popular enough that he can one day become a rival or betray the revolution like Malinovsky. Kirov is a threat. His very existence as a popular figure in the party there might be a rallying round Kirov in opposition to Stalin. Stalin needn't have no fear by 1934, but he did fear. Friendship and loyalty do not matter to Stalin. Not if someone is a potential threat to his power. If Kirov is a threat, then remove him. That's, that's the simple way it's done in revolutionary terms. On December the 1st, 1934, Sergei Kirov walks into his office in Leningrad. At the time, his death is an outrage and a mystery. What no one realizes is that Kirov's murder is part of Stalin's master plan. The assassination of Kirov was the beginning of Stalin establishing himself as the absolute ruler. The party leader decides to seize the opportunity and get rid of all his old rivals at once. The best way to do it is a purge. And the best way to do that is to demonstrate that his arch enemies were responsible for the beloved Kirov's uh, death. He begins by arresting Lenin's old deputy, Lev Kamenev, and his supporters. He accuses them of being traitors and of conspiring to murder Kirov. The trouble is, Kamenev is a party member with impeccable credentials, one of Lenin's original team. 
He has to show to the Soviet people that the accusations are true. Because it seems incredible that they could have been traitors. That they could have been anti-socialist, anti-Marxist, anti-Leninist all along. To make the absurd accusations credible, Stalin needs a confession. Kamenev and other top party leaders are taken from prison to the Kremlin, where he makes them an offer they cannot refuse. If you accept your fate and say what the party requires of you, then I can guarantee that your family will not suffer. Now, is it worth your family suffering? And of course, being committed to their families, they back off. With their confessions in the bag, Stalin puts Kamenev and 15 other senior party members on trial. Foreign press are invited to view the proceedings. They attended the show trials and they expressed pleasure. The system was so perfect that the accused voluntarily confessed and they were listened to and treated very humanely. Stalin's plan works perfectly. His old rival Kamenev and the other alleged conspirators are shot. He stages two more show trials for the most senior party members. Others, lower down, are simply arrested and executed. He wipes out over a thousand of the leading party members who gathered the Congress. And of the committee, the Politburo, made up of 45 members. Uh, within two years, only 11 of them are remaining. The Great Purge wipes out anyone who might challenge Stalin's power, including more than half of the army's top brass. He was the only tree left standing in the forest after Lenin's death. No one could contradict his narrative about the revolution, the 1920s and the 1930s. No one living. But even now, he does not feel secure. There are other witnesses to his failures as leader. The Soviet people. Millions of them lived through the revolution and the years that followed. And they might remember the truth. Now, they must be forced to forget. After the Great Purge, he unleashes the Great Terror. Stalin's dreaded secret police, the NKVD, predecessors of the KGB, are given the job of cleansing the country of what he says are traitors. He would set targets for arrests. They were called the limits. In every city, every province, had its uh, limits. They didn't care who they were. They wanted numbers killed, because that's how Bolshevik did things. Uh, 5,000 here, 10,000 there, of whom about a quarter were to be shot straight away. Stalin personally signs the death warrants of those senior enough in the party structure. There are 44,000 names. Uh, on which you have Stalin's initials and ticks. He would add words like scum, prostitute, deserves it. He was enjoying it enormously. Stalin, by that point, is by any normal standards uh, a psychopath, an incurable psychopath. The Soviet tyrant doesn't stop with the adult population. He wants to break down any loyalty that is not to him. To do that, he attacks the most fundamental human social unit, the family. Children were made to see themselves as children of Stalin first and of their parents second. And if their parents were suspect, they were asked by their teachers to report back. And there are scores, hundreds in the end of stories, of children actually betraying their own parents. Soviet society collapses under Stalin's relentless onslaught. 
Fear is at the heart of it. You are putting fear, distrust into the heart of society. And then you can achieve anything. At least 700,000 people are executed. Millions are sent to slave labor camps known as the Gulag. No one in the country dares even to think of challenging Stalin's leadership. He is now effectively the Tsar of the Soviet Union. But outside the Soviet Union, a new enemy is rising. Adolf Hitler is the only man who might match Stalin's lack of empathy and disregard for humanity. He is hell-bent on wiping out communism. Nevertheless, in 1939, Stalin cuts a deal with Hitler. They divide up Eastern Europe between them and agree that they will not attack each other. Stalin didn't trust anyone, but he trusted Hitler because he saw Hitler as a great leader, a very strong leader. He had this belief that if the Soviet Union and, and Germany can work together, then they can conquer the world. Even after the Nazis take France in 1940, Stalin believes that the Soviet Union is safe because Hitler will not want to fight on two fronts. A big mistake. In summer 1941, Stalin had the first real big shock of his life. Hitler launches Operation Barbarossa and invades Russia. Nazi tanks plow towards Moscow in a devastating advance. They capture more than 100,000 men in the first week. Suddenly, Stalin is facing the fight of his life. Hitler's panzer army is cutting through Russia like a knife through butter. Supreme leader Joseph Stalin is dumbfounded. He retreats to his country house, known as a dasha. He sat in a chair looking at the wall, he sat in his dasha outside Moscow, and refused to comment when news came to him. It seemed to be an attack of depression. He did nothing for something like three weeks. As the German tanks close in on Moscow, a delegation of Stalin's deputies muster up the courage to go and find him. He was extremely shaken. He said, Lenin built the state. We're going to lose it. And he, he, you know, he was close to panic. Had he stayed paralytic for another two, three days, refusing to allow proper response on the Soviet side, he may well have lost the war. They said, Comrade Stalin, we need you. We need your leadership. And he came back and he regained his, his vitality and he led the country after that. Back in charge, Stalin tries to take full control of the war. He would interfere, forbid generals to retreat, even when it made military sense to retreat. Stalin is an expert at killing helpless people. But he knows nothing about how to run a real war. He lost army after army, division after division. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers are slaughtered as the Nazis conquer vast swathes of Russia. It wasn't for a year or two that Stalin finally learned that you leave the army to get on with the job and you concentrate on supplying them with tanks. One thing that Stalin does not relinquish is his hardness. His firstborn son, Yakov, is fighting at the front. In July 1941, He's captured by the Germans. 
the Germans thought they had a trophy. So they, uh, they negotiated to get some German generals back in exchange for Yakov. The Man of Steel shows Hitler how ruthless he really is. And Stalin said, I don't swap generals for a soldier. That, of course, impressed the Germans enormously. And Yakov eventually threw himself on the electrified barbed wire and, and died. Yakov is one of more than 20 million Soviet citizens who give their lives in the fight against the Nazis. To their leader, they're just another statistic. Despite his early interference, a combination of winter and the extraordinary bravery of the troops turns the tide of war. All invaders of Russia, except the Mongols, have made one mistake. They don't believe the weather reports. Napoleon wouldn't believe it. Hitler wouldn't believe it. So General January, General February are the biggest generals in the Russian army. The Soviet army slowly pushes the Nazis back, mile by bloody mile, through Eastern Europe. Hitler's forces are broken. On May the 2nd, 1945, Russian troops overwhelm Berlin. The war is over, but a new conflict is about to begin. In the summer of 1945, Stalin meets US President Truman and British Prime Ministers Churchill and then Attlee to discuss the details of the peace. Western leaders are hoping for a golden era and an end to all war. But Stalin will later reveal his hand. No one will ever be able to invade the Soviet Union again. Because he is going to keep every inch of the territory his army has taken. After five long years of war, the West doesn't have the stomach to oppose him. He would agree to democratic elections, of course, but as Stalin said, it's not important who votes, it's important who counts the votes. And that was something he was going to do himself. Stalin builds the Iron Curtain. 90 million people who thought they would be free are now yoked to Stalin's brutal ideology. The Cold War begins. By the time of Stalin's 70th birthday celebrations, his shadow has fallen across an empire from Eastern Europe to Kamchatka. Along with 180 million people in the Soviet Union, a further 90 million in conquered Eastern Europe are now forced to live in servitude to Stalin. If anyone objects, the Great Terror is repeated across country after country. Stalin had total power. He probably had more power than any individual uh, in the world up to that point. The Cold War will run for almost half a century. But by now, the Soviet dictator has cardiac problems, and his health is declining. In old age, he uh, could not be as active. He could not control things as well. He's just losing it, you know? And, and that's the way life is. And he hadn't figured on that. He spends more and more time at his dashes, gardening. But he's still paranoid and looking for new threats. He starts to focus on a new enemy. Towards the end of his life, of course, he becomes more and more anti-Semitic, violently anti-Semitic. The hated traitor Trotsky, originally Bronstein, had been a Jew, and Lev Kamenev had a Jewish father. There was one thing that Stalin shared with Hitler, suspicion of Jews. 
uh, because they don't owe loyalty to one country, they could easily be spies in Stalin's view. In January 1953, Stalin launches another purge. He arrests the country's top medical men, accusing them of treachery and conspiring to destroy the Soviet leadership in what has become known as the Doctor's Plot. Most of the accused are Jewish. They're taken and tortured for confessions. Stalin goes, beat them, beat them, beat them with death blows. I want those confessions. One of the doctors had to be carried into interrogations on a stretcher because he had been beaten so badly he couldn't walk. Some scholars believe that Stalin may have been planning a massive purge of Soviet Jews. Stalin had already approved the building of four major new concentration camps in the Far East. The speculation is that these concentration camps were being built for the Jews. But Stalin's last purge will never happen. On March the 1st, 1953, the father of the nation is alone in his room. He was sitting on a sofa. He was, he'd well oiled, he'd drunk a lot. <coughs> he appears to have had a heart attack. <coughs> And he fell over on one side and made burbling noises for an hour or two. <laughs> the most feared man in Russia lies alone for almost a day. Absolutely no one dares to enter the room. Finally, his deputies gain the courage to come in. They find Stalin lying in a pool of his own urine. But still, they don't dare touch the body. They're standing around in terror, looking at this body, as it may be, and a little cleaning lady comes in. And she pushed away between people and said, get out of my way. And she looked down and said, oh, he's dead. Come on, let me. And she starts to hoover underneath. When the news is revealed, the Soviet Union is convulsed with grief. <laughs> Many find it hard to believe that Joseph Stalin, the beloved father of the nation for 30 years, is dead. For three days, the tyrant's body is displayed in Moscow, while millions file past to pay their respects. The feeling at Stalin's funeral was that the strong man that held this country together has gone, and he's left us with an, a number of ghastly incompetents who will fight and rip the country apart. Despite 30 million deaths and decades of savage brutality, at the time, Stalin's propaganda has cemented him in the public imagination as the embodiment of all that is good in Soviet Russia. All the press, all the media is directed to elevate and exalt Stalin's name. And every textbook that's published, every play that's written, whatever the theme has to have some reference to the greatness of Stalin. He's projected himself as a son. Uh, the state was Stalin. Stalin was the state. Stalin was the Soviet Union. Without him, the Soviet Union would fail. Stalin had, in some ways, transplanted the religion that he'd been brought up in. He transferred that to socialism. And he had become the god of that so-called paradise, which he had built up over nearly 30 years. The name Stalin becomes, in itself, almost a prayer, and people chant it. What no one is told is that even in death, Stalin is a powerful, destructive force. 500 people are crushed to death by the crowds of hysterical mourners. Stalin's brutality does make him one of the most terrifying people in history. I think he was an evil man. I think for him, you know, human liberty and human, human life was worth very little. 
Stalin got away with it in the sense that the system that he created basically went on for another 50 years. Even now, you'll still hear people in Russia who can remember his time, who say that for all his failings, he made the Soviet Union an achievement which he could have got by no other means. There are many elements of Stalinist thinking that are still alive in this world. And if we don't understand how precious our liberal democracy is, yes, there will be another Joseph Stalin.